Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming to the Drupal.org panel and Q&A. We're gonna be talking about updates to Drupal.org's infrastructure, the way we manage uh, features for developers, the things we do to support the adoption journey in the community, um, and some thoughts for the future. And so we'll have updates for basically everything that's happened since Vienna, um, and some uh, interesting developments that you may or may not have seen in the What's New on Drupal.org blogs. Um, as we get started, um, I do just want to familiarize you with some of the faces that you might see up here or recognize in other places in terms of the DA engineering team. Um, so I'm Tim Lennon, Hessenet on Drupal.org. We have Neil Drum, Ryan Aslett, uh, Brendan Blaine. I'm going in picture order. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Danya Girish uh, has been sponsored to work with us um, and is remote in India and helping us uh, out on quite a number of things. And then we have Narayan Newton from Tag1 Consulting, who helps with infrastructure, and from the Infrastructure Working Group, Michael Hess. Um, so these are the names and faces of the people who keep Drupal.org online, keep everything up and running, and we really appreciate your feedback and your support, um, which is why the first part of this conversation is always a thank you. So thank you to the members and community volunteers who support what we do. You directly fund our work, you fund our salaries, you make it possible for us to do any of the things that we do to serve the community. Um, we also want to thank all of the organizations, some of whom you may work for, that uh, sponsor this work, sponsor the conference, um, and make it possible for us to do what we do. Um, without that kind of support, it just we simply couldn't do what, what we do. And I'll talk about some of the financial constraints that, are, um, that we have on our infrastructural side uh, as part of this presentation. So in terms of what we're talking about today, this is the sneak preview that I gave during the um, uh, public board meeting. We're going to talk about uh, six broad categories of information, how we support adoption, how we support community, how we promote Drupal, some feature updates since Vienna, um, Drupal CI, the testing infrastructure for um, the Drupal project, and some infrastructure and security. Um, and then following that, we'll talk about some plans for the future, both in features and in some proposed core initiatives and initiatives that you might have heard in the Dries note. Um, that are going to be a collaboration between the association and other volunteer parties, core committers, things like that. So, uh, so firstly, to talk about supporting adoption. Um, uh, I, again, I mentioned this in the public board meeting, but we wanted to do an analysis of who the anonymous visitors to Drupal.org are to better understand um, our community, especially those people who aren't the engaged users yet, who haven't yet registered accounts, and who we still want to bring in and convert to the community. Um, anonymous traffic is 93% of our total sessions. Um, so it's actually arguably a, the largest underserved part of our community. Um, and so what we did is we used some audience insight tools uh, wrapped in our own implementation of Do Not Track to prevent um, uh, anybody from any of these organizations from maybe playing fast and loose with the rules there. Um, and targeted only at the anonymous traffic to learn things about the job functions of the visitors to Drupal.org. These job functions are about the role that an individual plays based on the data that's aggregated about them within an organization. It's not the industry they're in, but it's the role that their job might be associated with. So engineering and information technology, that could be in a services company, but that could be in a media company, or that could be in a marketing company, any, or a nonprofit. It could be in any of those industry areas, but this is the role that the person um, engages in. And so we found out a lot about, um, you know, we know that our dominant uh, users are in engineering and IT. That's not surprising. Um, you can see that uh, really half the amount of the technical users go to the front page, just go to the rest of the site. They're usually involved in the issue queues, working on projects, doing contribution. But the front page traffic is mostly made up of these roles in business development entrepreneurship, design, marketing, communications, um, and these other roles that we haven't historically served very well. So we, we've done this as sort of an, an initial analysis, and it's been part of the work that we did to redesign the front page of Drupal.org. Um, I'll get into that a little bit further. In terms of supporting the community and a lot of those efforts, um, there's a number of different things that we did. One is uh, we asked the question, how can we amplify the voice of the community? Uh, and in particular, the community working group, because with all of the conversations going on about governance and community issues, um, that voice needs to be heard. And I, if whether or not you're familiar with this, in the past, 
most communications from the CWG came out in the form of like a Google Doc that got tweeted by their account. It, wasn't, it didn't have an official home somewhere on Drupal.org. So um, this wasn't a technical challenge. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a big deal. But what we did is we revamped the community homepage on Drupal.org and in particular created a new blog, gave access to the CWG so that there's now a canonical source for those communications and so they can be included in Drupal Planet and all of those sorts of things. Um, which will hopefully help foster the engagement and extend the reach of their communication. Um, we've also been working on improving membership tools on Drupal.org. Um, this is still uh, a work in progress, um, but hopefully most of the people in this room are members. Um, one thing you'll see, uh, it's now actually hosted directly on D.O. The association website is sort of semi-deprecated. We're mostly using it just for elections at this point. Um, and we have a new individual member directory with new filters so that you can learn about the community and new, the new members of our community. At the time of this snapshot, we had about 2,400 uh, individual members uh, who were listed in the directory. Um, and while the work isn't complete, we've got the donation system fully migrated over and the member system is sort of in beta, I would say. Um, we're also adding some long, long standing feature requests like your donation history um, and things like that that people often want to go back and take a look at. So, uh, anything to add on the subject? Okay. okay. Um, and then the other community support issue that was really important to us is how can we help people signing up for new accounts feel safe and included? As you, well, many of you here probably have had accounts for a long time, so you may not even remember. But um, the last time the gender field, for example, on user profiles was updated was something like eight years ago, or nine years ago. And the state of the community conversation around that at the time was perhaps reasonable for the era, but not particularly good. And the state it was left in was, uh, like, frankly, offensive to some people in the community. It was a barrier to people wanting to participate with us. Um, and so we've taken a first step, not a final step, to try and make that better. Uh, which is to say, on the left here, we started using demographic self-identification options across a variety of axes. This is based on the big eight or big 10 principles that you might have heard of if you've uh, looked into this before. And these are what we actually use in our speaker submission forms. Um, so anyone who spoke, you've, you've seen these options um, to help identify the diversity of our speakers. Um, and so we've put that onto the new account registration process to remove our outdated form, um, our offensive previous form, but we wanna take future steps. And so I've been having some conversations here with uh, Nikki and Tara and other people involved in DDNI about uh, the Open Demographics Initiative, which is a GitHub repository where people are collaborating on um, uh, identity and ways to do self-identification and things like that. And um, it's mostly been standing up in hallways and talking about this, but I think the consensus we're coming to is turning that into an API that, we could, that could be consumed in a module would help us be in a situation where we continue to stay up to date. <clears throat> we continue to stay up to date um, as these things change, as, as missing identifications get added to the system, instead of deploying a change and finding out five years from now that we're behind again. So hopefully that'll be an effort that proceeds well. Uh, in terms of promoting Drupal, you'll, you'll notice that the thrust of these slides gets increasingly technical, but um, in terms of promoting Drupal, we've done a, a few things since Vienna. Um, we've launched a new industry page, a solution page about the nonprofit industry. There's some interesting case studies there that just in passing and some more that might be coming soon. Um, things around some pretty significant decoupled projects, actually, that I just talked to some people here in the, in the conference that uh, might be of interest. Um, and we partnered with Forum One to produce the content for this page. And if you're curious about why we have the industry content that we do, we currently have healthcare, government, uh, nonprofit. Um, what are the others? We're working on e-commerce and travel. Education. Education. Yeah, it's all based on um, it's all based on the partners that we found who are domain experts who can help us to come up with the information that helps an evaluator in that industry. So since we are a very small team, we don't have those domain experts or those content curation ex experts. I'm more or less an engineer, but I find myself writing landing page content. Um, so we need to work with these people uh, to get, yeah, media and publishing is the other one that currently exists. So um, in addition to that, um, and everybody's aware of this because you're here and you've been using the website for quite a while, um, around Vienna, we launched a new DrupalCon brand um, and this is a unified brand for the event. 
So um, uh, we now have a central brand identity for DrupalCon itself with elements that become specific to the cities and locations that we go to. So we retain both the local color, but also don't have to re-implement the wheel for every event, which uh, with the level of resourcing we have, is just not sustainable. Um, and I think that's been very successful. And just, just from like, you know, the production and print graphics and that amazing like window decal and all that, I think it's been uh, phenomenal uh, in this first uh, iteration. And then of course, everyone has seen by now the drupal.org redesign. Um, let me see if I can get this to do its thing. So um, I've been joking about hashtag lava lamp because of the cool fluid blobby shapes that um, appear in the background of the header and down in these uh, persona um, channels that we are funneling our traffic through. We're trying to reflect the kind of like fluidity and adaptability of Drupal. It actually is intended to, the Drupal is the drop. Um, it's fluid, it's adaptable, it's customizable. Um, and we're really happy with the new design and the new direction and also the ability to have a more complex top level navigation and IA. Um, and this is the point where I embarrass 611 yet again <laughs> by saying thank you to them um, for helping us uh, to put that together. Um, they have been partnering with us very closely to produce not only the DrupalCon branding, but also the Drupal Drupalador redesign and a number of other initiatives that have been really important to us. So we really appreciate their help. Um, lastly, from a sort of design or promotion point of view, uh, we recently did a overhaul of the way the hosting market, marketplace works. Um, it's not quite easy to tell everything that you can do just from this screenshot, but um, Neil worked on this quite a bit and um, more or less, we have a better combination of filters and features so that people can find, I want something located here, I want something specializing in my industry, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to let people actually find a hosting partner that's not just a generic choice, but one that will fit their particular needs. Um, okay, now we're gonna get technical. <laughs> and, and by technical, I mean kind of legal, um, which is the worst kind of technical. <laughs> um, so there's been a lot of angst in certain parts of the community, the parts that care about what licenses mean and whether things are compatible and can I use this library with that library and pull it into my module and that sort of thing in a number of important ways. And we've communicated this out already. It was done shortly after Vienna. But just to keep getting the word out, I'm gonna go through what some of these important licensing questions were. Um, so one of them was, can I commit GPL compatible code to a Drupal.org repository that's not already GPL? That seems like a simple one, and it is more or less a simple one. Um, and so we can now say, yes, you can do that. It's just that once it's redistributed, it will be redistributed under GPL2 or later as the standard. Um, so as long as it's the original license was, was GPL compatible, yes, it can be used. The next question was, can you use GPL incompatible non-code assets in Drupal projects? Um, so this, is, this might be icons, fonts, um, th things like that. Uh, and we clarify that you absolutely can package and distribute GPL code in aggregate. This is the language from the GPL. Um, and it's in section 3.2 if you're curious to read more. As long as you have the rights to whatever that, those assets are. Um, and it does not affect the license of uh, the code itself. Um, the next question was, can a Drupal.org project have a dependency on non-GPL code? So this is the new evolution of licensing concerns in a world of composer and dependency resolution, right? Because it's always been true that you can use GPL code with non-GPL code in a personal use case, but the GPL stipulates that you can't then distribute it without either having compatible licenses or one of them taking over or something like that, or sometimes not at all. So what the clarification here, the important one is, Drupal.org hosted projects can depend on or link to GPL incompatible code. Maybe that's via Composer or the historical example is um, modules that like say, hey, you're gonna have to go download a separate library before you can use this, before we had automated dependency management. Um, so that's absolutely allowed. It's just that we can't host those in, as part of the module. We can't pull those dependencies in as part of the module and distribute that together from Drupal.org. But you can run Composer and get, and get those things and that's all fine. Um, the other one that we got, which seems like it should be obvious, but wasn't written down anywhere and hasn't been written down anywhere in most open source projects. And actually to, to make a digression, when we started talking to lawyers about some of these questions, um, we discovered an interesting thing 
which was that a lot of legal teams, and I'm not a lawyer, so this is not legal advice, but we discovered that a lot of legal teams uh, who are at all familiar with open source said, when we would come to them with a question, they would say, well, you're one of the biggest open source projects, so what do you do? <laughs> um, like, when there's not prior case precedent, they're looking for industry standard practices across some of the largest examples, and we happen to be one of the largest projects. But anyway, one thing we don't explicitly affirm is, if you're building a client site and giving it to them, is that distribution? So can you start using those incompatible assets? Um, and then the answer to that is yes, of course you can, or else we couldn't have an industry <laughs> around building uh, Drupal sites. Um, so we explicitly affirm that if you're a provider assembling a code base under contract, that doesn't fall under the restrictive terms of distribution. That's you acting directly as their agent to provide them the project. You're a proxy, um, not distributing a product. Um, that's different than if you were selling en masse like pre-made images, that could be a different situation that had non-GPL code. The last question, which is still unresolved that some people have, and this is especially relevant to anybody who works with distributions, is should we allow some GPL3 only projects on Drupal.org? And right now that's currently unresolved. Um, the reason this is relevant to distributions is because distributions are packaged together typically and distributed from D.O. Um, or they're just a composer manifest, in which case it's a little bit less of a concern. Um, but this is, this is still an outstanding question. Um, Dries has to weigh in on it. More lawyers have to weigh in on it. And if we do do that, we need to make very clear that we're telling anyone who comes to evaluate a distribution or other project which license is relevant. For, for some very large organizations, they won't touch a GPL3, but GPL2 is fine. Um, and that has to do with something that they uh, unfairly characterized, I think, as a patent poison clause in three versus two. Um, so that's the kind of only unresolved question, but we're very happy that some of those other questions have been resolved, because if you've ever been waiting on something in the white list, the licensing white list, those things have just suddenly started getting cleared out now that we've had these questions answered. So talking about features on Drupal.org, um, that we had a few different updates since Vienna, more than these, but here are some of the highlights. Uh, one is related to Composer. Um, you know, you've heard a lot of people say Composer is too hard to use and it's too hard to figure out what the right way to do something is. So one thing we've done, and it's just a first step, is to make it easier, is on any individual release node, the Composer instructions are uh, included, along with a um, link to the general instructions about the proper ways to use Composer for managing dependencies. We want to start feeding that up to the project page level, so that's a little bit you know, you don't have to dig to find how to get to the composer instructions, but at the very least, that's a start and that's something that we can bubble up. Um, the other thing is there's a new composer initiative being thrown around here at DrupalCon, and that was part of the announcement in the Dries note, to standardize the way that Core uses composer um, and to create a set of best practices. Mm -hmm. And I think once those are defined, standardized, Core is updated, then we'll, we'll be better able to promote the sort of one true way or the best recommended way instead of having to deal with a diversity of possible options. If you've looked at the current documentation, there's sometimes four or five different ways that someone might recommend doing it. Um, another really good quality of life feature, and I think Brendan was working on this one for us, was just fixing our <laughs> friendly URLs for issues. It's not all node number anymore, for God's sake. So um, it's, <laughs> It's a small thing, um, but it's helpful and it's useful for search um, and for finding that particular uh, issue with, or uh, finding a particular issue you might be looking for. There's also some shortcuts that I just want to get the word out about because I think they'd be useful for people at the sprints on Friday trying to pass things around. If you have a node number, you can just put it in the search box and go straight there. You can also just do drupal.org slash i slash node and we go straight there. So you can, if you're shouting across the table on Friday, it'll be a little bit easier than, than what these URLs were before. And the old ones still work, of course. Um, Neil put together this one, the in-context issue tag explanations. You want to talk about it a little bit, maybe? Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, we use issue tags pretty extensively uh, in Drupal, especially in the core issue field. And there's a lot of meaning in these tags that's not upfront. And there used to be a uh, documentation page with all these explanations buried. Uh, now it's right on the uh, issue page, um, so you can figure out uh, 
you know, who needs to review the patch next or what needs to happen next and uh, have links off to um, more resources to help out. And I think there's a lot of lessons that new initiatives or contrib projects that, that have a lot of issues to manage or whatever could learn from some of the ways that issue tags were used with previous initiatives. Um, and being able, it's, it's more or less tools for an additional work, additional workflow steps or additional, you know, approval steps. Um, if you need usability review, accessibility review, whatever the case may be. Um, you may have also noticed that along with the redesign, there's a new top level navigation for Drupal.org. Um, we finally sort of broke down and said, you know, we have a lot of different audiences who have different needs and we don't want to bury things that you have to get to a landing page before you get a whole set of other, other menus and, stuff and such. But we do want to kind of reorganize into the categories of things that we think, you know, an individual user flow is probably all within this area or this area or this area. Um, and that's something that will probably continue to evolve, but it was just a nice, a nice change that came along with the new um, design. Uh, and now we're going to talk about Drupal CI a bit. Um, so I'm probably going to refer to Ryan. Um, but first, you want to talk about this? To uh, yeah. Um, Amazon Web Services uh, switched over the first second building back in October. For a while, we had to do a lot of things in, in uh, Drupal CI to kind of maximize the spare CPU time that we started with instance because we, you know, we dynamically scale our CI instances, and then sometimes a contrib patch might take four minutes to run, and we don't have another 56 minutes to test box anywhere else. And so we had a lot of strategies to try and uh, not kind of throw money away, spinning up instances needlessly. But uh, Amazon went for a second billing in October, which made it so that we could much easier uh, not have to worry so much about, um, we could just auto scale exactly to what our demands are. So since that change, we've been able to do stuff like just set up like 80 test bots. So if there's a spread going on, people need to. Um, yeah. Submit a lot of patches that they're all going to cut at once, and so it's uh, it's pretty nice. Yeah, that we have that now. There's it's, some hiccups getting it deployed. Yeah, there was, there were some hiccups getting it together in the first place, and there's some things that we still need to figure out, right? Because we were managing our total budget. This is where I'm talking about kind of association budget, right? We averaged something like four thousand dollars a month just on the test bots um, to pay for testing for core, um, and we would manage that before by saying, okay, we'll put a cap on the number of test bots. We'll try and reuse test bot cycles until we can uh, get them done and just kind of rate limit the total number of testing. Um, we don't really, we haven't had to do that in quite the same way since we moved to per second. We don't have wasted cycles, but we're noticing, um, and Ryan may not know this yet because I just checked it this morning, we're like, we're tracking to have a $6,500 month for April because of the con and things like that. Yeah, so, <laughs> so there's, there's still work to do to balance the easy availability and the speed of the testing infrastructure so that developer velocity is high with the budget that we have to provide that service. Um, and by the way, if anyone has super strong connections in Google Cloud, AWS, Azure, and anyone wants to donate instances, that would be phenomenal. So, and we're, we're talking to some people on that front. Um, there's also a really cool new feature in Drupal CI that I'll let Ryan uh, talk through. Yeah, um, Drupal CI in classical, you've been able to configure on Drupal.org for your projects to say, I want to be able to test with this type of environment, which version of PHP, which version of the database. And um, it, was, oh, sorry. it was expensive, but. Um, uh oh, we get paged. Yeah, I, the, the puppy is um, the, uh, it, it, there was a lot of options, but there wasn't a lot of control for uh, contrib maintainers and core maintainers to manage the build. And what we've done is the, the, this Drupal CI on the YAML file was always what was driving Drupal CI. But now what we've done is expose it so that you can put one in your project and add additional steps. So um, these, these keys here correspond to a uh, code plugin inside of, um, thanks Michael. Um, inside of Drupal CI itself. So like CSS, Lint, ES, Lint, PHP, CS. Uh, you might not want ES, Lint to run on your project. You might not have any JavaScript at all. So why not have steps? You can just take that out if you want to. There's a couple of uh, steps here that I haven't got here that are in need of better documentation, which is run arbitrary shell commands. 
So you can run whatever you want, basically, with setup. So like maybe your test acceptance requires you to generate some fake keys to get a testing API, or maybe you maybe you want to experiment with something and like just run a BDB test. And so any 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 commands that you run on the test box will then say the output of an artifact that will show up on day. So um, you know, it's, it, it allows maintainers to do a lot more than what they did before. And you know, the first first uh, value of this is that we're submitting on the core, or we're submitting the package core to break up the testing cycle. So it runs run tests and does just the unit tests first, and then it runs the kernel tests and then it runs so um, and then we'll fail fast. So if you have a bug in the code and the unit tests go fast, then we only run testing for an hour to find out that like, well, you know, we have done that for a second. So but yeah, you know, there's more documentation to come on that. Yeah. Um, and actually, if you're a power user of Drupal CI and want to help out with docs, you can probably do so during sprints. Um, let's see. So then we want to talk about a little bit about infrastructure and security, because that's been top of mind in the last couple of weeks, um, both how Drupal.org manages uptime and, and security and how we support things like the security team's efforts. Um, but I do want to talk a little bit just about maintenance and things that are probably on everyone's radar. Um, for a long time, obviously, PCI has been a thing. It's not new. Um, we ha the DA participates in commerce in three ways, memberships and donations, events, and jobs. Um, and so we've been working through this year to try and reduce PCI scope, um, reduce the amount of the, you know, the kind of questionnaire stuff that we would have to qualify for, and just reduce the overhead of managing uh, that for the e-commerce side. GDPR is a really big deal. Um, and something that's still, I think it's becoming better understood, but um, it still has some open questions uh, when it comes to how that's going to affect, especially open source projects. So just to give you the general overview, it's the General Data Protection Regulation. It's a European regulation. Um, and it uh, applies not just to European hosted um, data providers or data, data controllers or processors, but to anyone who does business in Europe. Um, and that concludes us. We have a global community. Um, and it, the regulations take effect or are relevant whenever there is personally, identifiable, informa personally identifiable information about a, what they call a data subject, an individual, or uh, in some cases, whether there's pseudonymous identifiers being used. The, a pseudonymous identifier means like a user ID or user net, something that stands in for, um, for another identifier. Um, and the most basic principles is that you need to have explicit opt-in to communication and data collection. You need to have a right to be forgotten, uh, sort of, in, or, in other words, account deletion process. You need to have some recourse for data portability. Um, it actually doesn't specify that it has to be automated at this point, but you do need some recourse for data portability. And the privacy policies in terms of service need to reflect what's collected, why, and how to contact an organization about that data. Um, so we've been doing a lot of prep work um, having some legal conversations. We've got blog posts prepped. Uh, Liz on the Drupal Association staff has actually been spearheading a lot of this, and you may have talked to her at the uh, booth throughout this week. Um, and so it's something, more or less, what I'm here to say is that we've got our eye on it. Um, fortunately, our community is so privacy and security conscious that a lot of the steps that they are now mandating as regulation are steps that we've already been doing um, in terms of affirmative consent, in terms of ability to delete accounts, um, not so much data portability, that's a different question, but um, so, and you know, the, the, I had a conversation actually with typo three maintainers uh, a couple months ago about GDPR and how they were thinking about it as an open source project, because the big question in their minds was, how does the right to be forgotten apply to Git history? <laughs> that's a scary question. Um, and the truth is, um, Probably what it's going to mean is just that people will have to implement a Git agreement, which we already have, that says you agree that this won't be forgotten. <laughs> Can't be. It's immutable. Um, and that's allowed under those regulations. It just needs to be very explicit. Um, and, and so that's, that's, that's the question for open source in general that I think is catching some people by surprise. Um, so let's talk about security. Michael, do you want to talk about this one a little bit or shall? Sure. So um, 
let me just first say, obviously we had some, a little bit of instability issues during the security release. We had some 500 errors. Um, could have been much worse. It was actually not, not so bad. But this was my favorite tweet during that period. Um, it's, it's, it's not bad. You certainly can't hack your board if it's down. So, um, yeah, why don't you? So for the, for the release of uh, 2018-02, uh, we did some things that were interesting on the infrastructure side. Uh, we're an open source product, and there is a delay between pushing the commits into Drupal and there actually being packages available for people to download and publishing all the bits and checking all the checkboxes. So we, we shut down Git publicly while that happened, uh, which went fairly well, with the exception of people really liked the F5 security page. Uh, <laughs> waiting to see if the update had been posted for two hours, which made it hard to post an update. Um, we've come up with some creative caching solutions uh, in the future to prevent that from happening again. Um, and so we, you know, we learned from our mistakes. We, we, it was interesting. I was in the middle of publishing that, and the retrospective meeting got scheduled in the middle of publishing it. Thank you, Tim. Yep. Um, and so part of the retrospective was to figure out where, where things went wrong, what the queries were that were causing things, and how should we, hopefully we don't have to, but should we do this again, we won't run into uh, that problem again. Uh, as far as the shutting down of the services, it seemed to work fairly well. Uh, we forgot to shut down one service, which we now have noted for next time. Um, using Perimeter X, uh, we haven't talked much about what Perimeter X does. But yeah. Actually, Narayan, do you want to talk about uh, some of the like malicious traffic and activity that was also correlated with the release window? <laughs> yeah, so we've been working on integrated something like Perimeter X, but we integrated using Perimeter X. Um, as basically a border filter for traffic instead of attaching malicious bot traffic or just misconfigured bot traffic, which is a lot of what we face. Um, the board has an API, but the API, if you look at the length of the project history, is fairly maintained and is sometimes incomplete. So people tend to scrape through the road for information. Um, and they don't always do that in the best way. And sometimes they actually cause infrastructure issues with the scraping because they try to do it like a concurrency of three and not waiting and all sorts of things you're not really supposed to do. Um, also, there are people that do it maliciously. So there are lots of things you can do to a Drupal website that will put pretty excessive load on a database server. And during the security rollout, there are people that were having fun doing that. Um, so we were having issues with the security page and the fact that uh, there was a query on the security page that Neil actually fixed uh, very nicely. Also, in caching around there to bring that back up. But the other issue we're facing is about uh, looking at the graphs afterwards, about 50% of our traffic was uh, malicious, um, trying to cause issues on the site. So we had uh, kind of suspected that there might be issues during the security release. So we had the filter uh, being tested in some chosen net blocks that were known to be bot specific so that we could tune it in so it wouldn't catch everyone who was actually a good user. Um, and we had it ready to slide into place in case there were issues. So when the site basically came back is when that caching was put in place and we put in the filter. Um, and the filter for the duration of the security release was basically blocking about 50% of our traffic. Yeah, yeah it's pretty intense. Invalid yeah. traffic, we should yes. say. Yes, invalid traffic. <laughs> yep. Um, simultaneous, simultaneously with that, a uh, few folks in the community, including myself and Neil and some maintainers of the Drupal Slack admin channel and things, uh, I think by, by 12.30 on release day, I had like 15,000 emails in my inbox that came from a, a sort of spam attack to try and fill it up and just disrupt our operations, I suppose. So, you know, this is the kind of challenge that we tend to face. Um, there are various kinds of scraper or DDoS either not without mal malintention or deliberate that happen, frankly, maybe once every two months. We have some, some kind of event. Uh, we've had one during the con that Neil has been dealing with the last couple of days. Um, and the, the positive side is, for the most part, that's been completely transparent to our community for the past several years, right? Apart from the, gl the, the glitch during the, um, the actual security release, which was probably the most intensive instance, the fact that we've had this every two months has not really been anything that anyone's noticed, and we're really proud of that fact. Um, and it's due to the work of this team, so. Um, 
You heard of these? <laughs> Meltdown Inspector. Um, Narayan, can you talk a little bit about how that impacts our infrastructure in particular? Yeah, so we have uh, a melting pot of hardware. <laughs> um, they all bring something different. Uh, so having yeah. this uh, in the beginning is kind of this, was somewhat simple. I was doing it for Google, I was doing it for some other point as well. And so we're kind of just going through and figuring out how the, um, the initial patch is going to impact performance and figuring out where exactly the performance kit was going to be. Was it going to be on the kernel patch or the microcode patch? <clears throat> so the initial patching uh, went out from that melting on the back pretty quickly. And then Red Hat immediately rolled it back. Um, and then the initial patching went out from VMware pretty quickly. VMware immediately rolled it back. So it's been um, an interesting task. <laughs> but at this point, patching is going well. Um, obviously, all the public, uh, all the all the public nodes were immediately uh, patched, no matter what the interesting patch was, because they had to be. And then the patch at this point is the kernel level patch is distributed out and applied. But the microcode patches we are working on getting completely out because we have a lot of backend servers that have interesting processors and some. That would be the summer. And um, can you talk a little bit about what impacts that might have had on our resource overhead and performance? I don't know how much. Um, well, that's very honestly, because the initial patch set and the initial microcode patch, we actually took a pretty large performance hit, and then they rolled back the microcode patch, and that alleviated it somewhat. We're still, in, in testing for Drupal under high load, we're still seeing probably about 10 to 15% drop. Um, we are uh, working basically on uh, rearranging some resources to bring some more resources to bear on the web node because that's where we're going to see the most impact. Um, so basically planning around that, similar to what I imagine everyone is doing. <laughs> yep. Cool. So now I'm going to start moving into talking about the future and some other initiatives that we have uh, moving forward. Um, and this is not an exhaustive list and it's not a list that is set in stone. Uh, it's always subject to change. We work as an agile engineering team uh, with an agile roadmap process and um, things come up from time to time like a big security release <laughs> um, and, our, and our kind of standard plans can change. But here's some of what we've got uh, in the pipeline. So one is OAuth support. Um, in particular, we want this support for uh, camps. Um, there's the variety of uh, efforts at different kinds of chat organizations that have had concerns about identity management and understanding that, hey, these are actually the person in the Drupal community that you think they are. Drupal Europe is coming up as an event, right? And that's not run on our infrastructure, so they would like to be able to let you, um, you know, log into their site with a Drupal.org account. So it's something we're looking into. We're currently basically in the middle of technical evaluation, code review, and security checks for some of the modules that exist on Drupal.org. Um, the next, I already mentioned this and kind of went into detail, so I won't go into too much, but the Open Demographics Initiative, uh, again, for more um, affirmative identification of who you are within the community, control over what you want to make public and keep private, all these things, um, it, it needs those two components. It needs the Open Demographic folks and any contributors who want to help them to turn that from a basically repo of plain text into an API with JSON that we can consume. Um, and then we need to build the module to consume it. Um, if you missed the uh, session on Tuesday about pull requests on Drupal.org, you'll be really excited right now. Um, so we are planning on moving towards a new merge request system on Drupal.org. Um, you may have seen a series of blog posts that I made in December about the options we evaluated, our requirements, everything we had there. I'm not going to read this slide. Um, but uh, it's all summarized in these blog posts. Um, and it talks about the open source, open source slash enterprise, proprietary enterprise, build it yourself options, all of these different things, and then also writes a sort of user story about the way the Drupal community collaborates and says, how can we adapt the way we collaborate to the models that can be provided by these various tool sets? And at the conclusion of that, um, 
of that first set of posts, that was not what you expected to see, which is to say, we looked at GitHub, GitLab, and Bitbucket, and said, okay, GitHub has hard blockers, and we talked to their engineering team, and they weren't gonna fix them. GitLab has hard blockers, and we talked to their engineering team, but we couldn't really get in good communication, and didn't seem like they were gonna fix them either. Um, and Bitbucket, which does not have the curb appeal of those, any, any of those other solutions, really. People, people never get excited about Elasium projects unless they're Michael. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but it checked all the boxes. We could, we could architect the workflow that allowed the many-to-one collaboration of the Drupal community using that tool set as a back end. So when you read that post in December, that's kind of the conclusion we came to. Then GitLab CEO showed up in the comment section and said, call me. Um, <laughs> so uh, we've been talking with them for the past several months uh, about clearing those blockers. Uh, and they've been heavily committed to that. They have shared Slack channels with uh, our team. Um, we gave them a list of issues. They fixed them. Um, they um, proposed um, uh, support to hopefully help fund some of the migration work, all this other kind of stuff, because they, from their point of view, they were really committed to think Drupal would be a banner project to show that they can be part of open source. So it's not absolutely final, but it's looking like this is the direction that we're gonna move into. And yes, I'd be happy to take questions, sure. Um, I'm happy to hear that. I'm kind of a, I mean, the fact, the fact that they have a CE, a community edition that is open source at all, it make, in, in many ways makes that potentially a better fit. So just, just even that fact alone, considering that GitHub is not open source, and Bitbucket is not open source. Like, so, um, I mean, I think that helps. Um, I think also the way that we're going to do the implementation is going to be interesting. So let me, um, I'll try to visualize it. I, we, I don't want to repeat the whole session that happened on Tuesday. So Tuesday at five o'clock, we had a whole session with much more detail and a lot of Q&A. So I recommend that you watch that session. But the rough idea is Drupal.org retains project pages, retains issues, um, retains kind of the home of any individual project, but then allows, uh, creates on the back end a repository per issue in GitLab and allows you to create one to N branches that people can collaborate on for each proposed solution they might have to resolving that issue. And then we get code reviewed tools, inline editing, all of those things exposed to the UI. And we do this in a progressive way. We initially just transparently change our custom Git backend to the GitLab backend, and nobody would really see that change, just up, you know, hosting the repositories. Um, and then after that, we'd start exposing functionality like replacing CGit with the code review tools, and then introducing merge requests um, and these new branch models. So. Uh, it's something that I think is pretty exciting. Um, and there's APIs to do things to let us say, okay, you go into the code review side interface and start doing these things. We can call back and say, okay, that branch was updated and maybe there's this diff and may we can decide we're still negotiating how much do we pull back from the code review into the inline issue stream or how much does the issue become about the problem statement and the sort of architecture of the solution and then the merge requests about code review and, and specific detail. So. Um, those are all details to be worked out as we keep moving forward on that, but it's, it's really exciting. Um, and this is that session I was referring to that happens Tuesday at five o'clock. It is recorded, so if you have a lot, if you have any more questions on that, I'd highly recommend checking out the recording. Um, finally, um, we are hopefully going to be collaborating uh, with, uh, on several sort of core initiatives or initiatives that are not traditional core initiatives, but but uh, overlap with some of the areas of responsibility for the DA. Uh, one is the proposal from the Dries note about simplifying Drupal's documentation, the notion of perhaps having an official documentation um, and providing the tooling for that if it's needed. Um, the question around this one right now, all of these are early stages. I'm not gonna go into much detail, but 
there's a content and editorial question that I think is more the, the harder part to solve than tools when it comes to documentation. <laughs> how do you make it official? How do you, how do you promote it in the right places? It's, it's much more difficult than just how can we write documentation that looks good, that, that part we can solve. So anyway, um, we'll be hopefully supporting those efforts and involved in some of the architecture of that. Another one is uh, the notion of better composer support and core. We talked about this briefly earlier. Um, this is a precursor to things like automatic updates initiatives and site builder tool and project browser, which is to say, right now there's five different ways to do something in Composer with Drupal. And maybe half of them are the wrong way or maybe none of them are the right way. And the point is uh, core could be updated so that there is a standard best practice method. And once we have a single process for using Composer that works well for all the use cases, then it's something we can automate. Then it's something we can abstract away and build tools on for the non command line using site builders. Um, another initiative, and this is gonna be a kind of a, a more complex thing, it's not really a core conversation, but it's sort of been called Hello Drupal, but it's a concept of reimagining the Tri Drupal experience, because we know that that's something that is friction for a lot of existing Drupal users because it feels just too much like an ad and not like a good demo experience. And so thinking about trying to create a product forward here is a beautiful demo of out of the box, umami, blah, 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 blah. But while preserving, unfortunately, the existing tri program, well, fortunately, provides a quarter million dollars to the association. Um, it helps fund a lot of things. So we want to figure out how to marry those two in a way that gives a good user-facing demonstration of what Drupal can do and also supports uh, some of the revenue that lets us do these programs. Um, another one, this is, again, not really a technical one, but an editorial one, is providing evaluator product comparison information. Like there's nowhere in Drupal.org that says why we're better than Sitecore or Adobe or whatever. Like we just, so the promote Drupal initiative that you've been hearing about throughout the week is important to that. It's important to finding the domain experts that can help us write the content and feature it in the right place on Drupal.org to get those 93% of anonymous users, you know, 20% of those being CXO, director, business development types to actually see the information they're looking for, which is not the same as what our developer audience wants to see. Um, and then, as I said, building on something like the composer, uh, the initial better composer support initiative, we can start understanding the automatic updates initiative. And again, there was a session about the Drupal core auto update architecture and some proposals about how to make that a secure process, um, focusing on the balance between usability and security and uh, the things that we would need, and I recommend taking a look at that as well if you're interested in that topic. Um, I mentioned before, this work could be built on for a site builder tool, a project browser. Um, and lastly, well, two more things. We want to do a telemetry initiative. We want to gather data about who's using Drupal. We get, we get a little bit, very little bit of information coming back from the update stats because everybody phones home, or just about everybody who doesn't turn it off. Um, but we could be learning more. We could have this opt-in to send anonymized analytics to Drupal.org and um, let us know what are the real use cases, what modules people care about, uh, like, and provide information back to the contribution community to know where their efforts would be best focused. And finally, um, our reach on Drupal.org is massive, but it is a fraction of Drupal sites, right? So being able to have some limited carefully curated, appropriate communication about what's going on in the project within Drupal itself could be extremely valuable to reaching those people who use Drupal but don't realize they can be, that they are part of a community. They're already part of a com community and they don't know it. And being able to say, hey, there's a DrupalCon and hey, there's this event and hey, there's this important release happening, all those sorts of things from somewhere in the uh, administrative interface could be quite valuable. All right, so that's my long spiel. I think I went longer than I intended, but. Are there any additional questions or other topics people would like to raise? Um, maybe we should. I'll, we... I'll repeat the questions. Okay, so go ahead. So um, I want to thank everyone for going out and working on Drupal.org. It's I've tried to be involved in helping to move the world and found it much more difficult than the rest in, in fixing issues in the core, which most people find intimidating. So those people are here and we're I mean, things a little ahead. It really takes a great deal of uh, patience and persistence. I really appreciate that. 
I noticed that most people who are here, I think, are technical people. So I don't think that most of the problems we're dealing with in drupal.org are technical. There are technical issues, but we really need to have drupal.org be here and have people looking at design thinking, looking at usability. We can't just be the, the Uber geeks who are here right now. Mm -hmm. Going back to the initial slide and comments on trying to get people involved in the Drupal.org, something that's that's really clear that's missing. We're not asking anonymous users to join. Yeah. And I don't know why and how that has been happening. This is something that is has been going back for I don't know. This goes back to the Prairie Initiative. Yep. These are right. Was going off looking at ways to get people involved. If we don't ask people who are on our site to join, how will they know they know that they should be doing things? Yeah, and I think I think that's a really good point. And I think um, so. For example, the hang on a second. Uh, so to summarize your point. Okay. Thank you. Um, <laughs> for the recording. Uh, we need to be focused on not just technical uh, details on implementation of your org, but all the other stuff, UX, UI, documentation, community engagement, and specifically, why are we not asking anonymous users to join? Maybe not all of you need to do that. But it needs to be focused on. Yeah, I'm not yeah. saying we need to, it needs to be focused on. Yeah. Yeah, so somebody somebody needs to, to to be thinking about these things, and I think that's absolutely true. Um, I think in terms of where we are and whether any steps have been taken on that front, um, as small as they may be, I think the first one was the new front page redesign, and I'll say it for this reason. What we discovered in our research is, I don't know if you remember the old website, but if you looked just above the fold at the previous homepage, I think you could count something like 17 or 22 calls to action just above the fold in one spot. And that makes it really difficult, regardless of your persona, to figure out what the hell am I supposed to do next? So it was very, very tricky. So one of the, one of the key elements here was, okay, we're identifying three core personas that represent our core audience of existing users and the most present audience of some of these anonymous users. So what we've done is I think we've created the top of the funnel, but we haven't solved and, it's, and this is largely content and usability questions, we haven't solved the problem of where is that funnel going to lead those people? Um, and we're, we've started it, but I think we're going to definitely need help to figure out how to make that a complete you want a says, Well, there's that too. <laughs> yeah. Yes? Uh, so you said at the beginning that you often end up having to write information, uh, write contents that's, that's personing or uh, like tending to like Drupal in a specific marketplace that's not necessarily your, your forte. Um, what's being done to reach out to people who are using Drupal in, say, education and get those people to actually write the content for it? So the question is, um, how are we seeking out domain experts, particularly for content writing in areas where we don't have that knowledge? Um, hopefully that's not the servers. Um, <laughs> um, and the answer is all of those, so for the industry pages, for example, the solution pages, all of those were made in concert with partners so far. So we were like, we would reach out to, okay, maybe we know that there's an agency that specializes in that particular industry and we'd say, hey, can you help us make this content? Um, that's how the nonprofit page came about. That's how a lot of these came about. Um, and it's typically been kind of one-on-one -on -one outreach, um, although like, I would call out anybody who knows those areas, please do that. I've talked to several people in the higher ed space, um, just at the con, random standups here, who said, hey, we've got ideas about this, or we've got ideas about additional levels of this conversation. So one example for, for higher ed was, you know, right now it's focused on, maybe I run a university or, or other organization that hasn't looked at Drupal or has heard of it, but isn't sure whether to adopt it. And that's kind of the persona that that's targeted to. But there's equally this persona of people who use Drupal within their university, um, but aren't connected to the others who do it, and aren't taking advantage of a community of Drupal users in higher ed that exists, um, and aren't learning how to, they don't, they're not sharing techniques on how we got to allocate our time to actually contribute as part of our jobs, right? Um, and all of that would be really useful. Um, but it's a matter of finding the people, you know, individual contributors, consensus building, recruitment, um, like most, um, like most efforts to find a maintainer for something, you know. I believe there was a question. Yeah. Thank you. 
Um, you mentioned that in the personas that have, that have been called out now in the new site, um, one of them you identified as really the existing Drupal users. Right? Sure. Um, it occurred to me that I think a big chunk of the existing Drupal users are site builders, right? And I yep. don't see that persona. Is, there, is that something that's considered or Sort of, that's a good question. Um, I think it goes along with some of these other initiatives about the, um, like the automatic updates and the, and the site builder tool and the uh, standardizing the way core uses composers so that we can build an abstraction above it for the site builders. The problem, one of the problems is I don't think we can solve, right now we can't just solve content for the site builder on a content level. We actually need to solve some technical problems to make it possible for that to not be, frankly, a crappy experience. And so I think we want to unify that so that the underlying practices that, us, that a, the, the hardcore developer is doing are actually the same things that the site builders are doing. They just have a tool that abstracts it for them. And then at that point, I think it will become easier. But there's definitely work to do. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and did exactly what I would have said this time. You were at the Impact Small Temple organization. I was not, no. That was very interesting in that a number of site builders uh, stood up and said, we need a, we don't, we're not developers, we are uh, one person or two in shops, and actually we love it. It is easier for us. Interesting. Because it has to do with whoever else. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's only going farther in that direction. But we really feel like we just have to know that we were already in Drupal and the messaging would not tell an outsider. And that's interesting because I think since, frankly, before the release of it, while it was still in development, the community has told a narrative of this is going to be super hard for the site builders. And that's, that's an interesting point. I should check out that recording. Okay. Yes, please. Yeah, um, we're, we're, we're offering some technical solutions, like getting the code to work in the event of being in I think um, what, I was also at this small court, and I heard two people say about composers. I just want to emphasize that we have technical solutions. We also have to provide an editorial content solution to communicate something. I think we, with Composer as a community, fail to communicate the importance. How, like, because there's a certain part of the community, I agree with you, there's going to be a 20% that needs your site, needs a UI for it. Sure. And 40% automatically get it, and then we've got a gap there. We've lost a bunch of people because we didn't sit in the community and say, okay, this is a little hard, but incredible. I mean, I need to switch to most recently. It's brilliant, incredibly valuable. Yeah. You have to communicate that. I mean, I put out there when we were talking that we need a video that says, okay, this is composer. Don't be afraid. It's command line. <laughs> it's okay. And I yeah. think composer, and I'll put out something that's a really interesting example for composer. Composer should have invested when someone does their first composer update on their site, which is a congratulations on your first composer update. You are entering the world of PHP. It's not a big yeah. deal, but a bunch of abstract developers get upset. They don't understand how to talk to people. <laughs> I, I, that's a, I, I came with that example. We need to do that as we do the small initiatives to communicate and emphasize communication. I think that's absolutely true. And I think, unfortunately, one of the tricky resourcing constraints just in the association, right? As you pointed out, engineers. <laughs> Is this is this whole room, um, and you know the promote Drupal initiative is to help us get some more resources in that's focused on promotion, not on communication about usability and onboarding, which is another area in which we have a lack. But I think we're going to at least in part be relying on some community resources. And frankly, like if someone came to me with a wireframe that said or a video, like we don't have video production facilities, but some people actually do within marketing and media organizations. <laughs> yes. Okay, I had to, to Another session, to a similar Drupal idea. Right. He didn't bring this up. I want to emphasize. I said, okay, I got to back up a second. So I'm going to the web form module. I do videos in the web form. My experience has been incredibly positive to the point where I was just saying, I don't think everyone watches the video. I'm at like 40% maybe watching the videos. Five people approach me. They are incredibly smart. They get the web form module. They're like, thank you for the videos. I know they never watched them, but it made them feel better when they started using the module and know that they're there. So I yep. sold There's, on videos and communicating them. And yep. going back to Drupal I did some research with the videos and I wanted to have related links. So I started linking to materials. And I said, I'm going to link to anything that's relevant. I want to link to the data content on Drupal. Yep. Because data is the most relevant thing. And maybe the DA could explore with videos, taking all the people producing these outside resources and getting it on Drupal.org and making money from it by offering the video. 
you know, maybe it's, it's placement where you're having two, multiple resources bidding on the system. Yeah. They're able to get the you know, the quick growth, you know, they go to CPS or return. Yeah. And we start generating good content. I don't think we want an issue seeing one, you know, it's paid produced content that links maybe two of these third party resources because this is the best way. Yep. Yeah. It's complex. Spending fifty dollars a month for a new developer is not bad. So yeah, no, I, I think I think it's really interesting, and it's certainly something we've talked about before. I think we've even talked about it with you know the Drupal Me folks to a certain extent. Um, one of the things I will say that's interesting is you may remember when we announced the industry page initiative. I think there was Dublin, and of course we um, we launched with we launched with three at the time. I forget. Um, so and of course we had to produce those three before Dublin. So it was probably. It's a year and a half, two years or something, of uh, to get us to five pages where we are now, working with content partners who are domain experts in their field, but who aren't necessarily 100% committed to this initiative because they've got their own businesses to run and things like that. So one of the things we need to crack, and there's value add, right? There's, there's placement of their case studies and things there, right? Um, but yeah, that's one of the things we need to crack is, is this coordination of people who are those experts who have to market Drupal and realize, hey, if you three do this together, you don't have to all do it over and over separately. Like we need to get people to realize that there's an efficiency in working with us to create the best materials. Um, and that's, that's proving tricky, but it's something that I hope we can figure out how to crack. Um, sorry, I'm going to go over here. Um, I guess just the thought that came up when we started the conversation, I think the, the answer is maybe a little bit in the tooling as well. Like I, sure. I went down the rabbit hole on something. I got misled by some documents. They documentation on Drupal.org and found out the answer was not complete. And I went in and sure. edited it. It was very Wikipedia. Yep. Workable. Uh, it's yeah. on my blog page. Um, well, we have a discuss page. I, yeah, I guess, you know, I guess, but I just went in and changed it. I guess. Totally. Yeah, which is mostly what we want. <laughs> the, like, as opposed to like some of these documentations are awesome. Maybe a model category kind of can go eventually. The difference, of course, being that if I was going to make that change from Symphony, I was going to pull request and sort of somebody else would have to curate. Right. It looks good to me and whatever. And, you know, so that the answer might be a little bit in the tooling that we might be better documentation. It basically, you know, with the pull request piece. It's interesting because. Um, we don't we don't go so far as the pull request thing, although we've experimented that with the Drupal 8 user guide. The Drupal 8 user guide is actually aggregated in from a repository, as opposed to the other types of documentation. Um, and that tooling around that is a little bit of a contraption, so it's not like ready to scale. But um, the documentation in general has a concept of maintainership. Has maintainers are alerted, for example, when these edits happen um, and what they are, and they can. Uh, actually, can they revert them? We may have, yeah. yeah. They can revert them in, in, these, in these different changes without. Um, but we also have a lack of priority around documentation. Like, again, I'm of a mixed mind about whether it's tooling, because there's some documentation that's phenomenally well maintained, but Joe Schindler is the only person on the documentations working group is active, really, right now. And it's like, it's very easy to say, well, if only someone would just maintain and curate, that's great, but who's gonna maintain and curate? Because um, we have 12,000 documentation pages. Yeah, so, so, but I, I, your point is absolutely valid. It's just that even if we provided that tool, we have to find the people who will take on the maintainership. Yeah, so. it's just a neuron that fired in my brain. Totally, totally. Really yeah. The real question I have is Sorry. the tooling I use most is Drupal, but not Drupal. Sure. And, uh, you know, long live IRC, IRC is dead, right? But <laughs> everybody's pretty, everybody who's actively doing it, official, unofficial, whatever it is. I take issue with that. Yeah. Um, is there an issue with that? Because I, I'm, I'm starting to hear rumblings that people are not happy. Yes. You know, so there's. And, there's but, but it's also not your thing, right? It's just, right, right, exactly. It's, so, it's, it's, so here's the thing about communication media, and I'm going to borrow uh, a metaphor. Metaphor? No, it's just a. A way of communicating this that Ryan came up with, which is that when it comes to how we communicate together as a community, it's not mandated, it's an election. It's wherever people choose to spend their time, right? They're gonna go where they go, and we can say, 
I'm sorry, everyone, we're going back to bulletin boards. Um, and that's the official Drupal way. And that's not going to make it happen. People still use Slack or still use uh, Rocket Chat or still use any of these other options. Um, and there's an interesting divide because you have the, I think you have a lot of people, particularly in North America, who use Slack and say a corporate environment and it's already there and they just want another Slack channel because it's so much easier. It's just a matter of convenience. And then you have a lot of people who are like the bleeding hearts of open source who aren't going to touch anything if it's, I mean, they're running Linux on their laptops. If you're, if you're saying, I won't use proprietary software and you're running a Mac, let's have a conversation. But like, but other than that, like, um, and so we're, I don't think we're ever going to solve the problem of unity uh, in terms of our chat solution. Uh, so as long as new chat solutions exist, we'd all still be on like AIM or Skype or something like uh, it's going to evolve. It will change. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. And I think it might even be worse for us to restrict it and say, sorry, we're doing this, we're doing this, we're doing this. And then maybe something suddenly gets better and we're choosing not to use it. Um, but it's tricky because Slack has also disabled their IRC bridges or is about to, which is making it harder for those people who still wanted to communicate that way. So, um, so it's not a cut and dry problem. And it's a, one of the reasons why, for example, the OAuth initiative to be like, well, at least we can have identity in these multiple areas that's unified will maybe help to resolve some of those issues. Um, but at the same time, if, if a vast majority was on one solution, um, and it happened to be a proprietary solution. If we could fund it, should we? You know, should we make sure there's history in Slack? Even if we're not trying to bless it as the one true way, should we be trying to pay because there's 4,000 of the core community there? Um, truthfully, that's pretty. That's pretty much the the position at the moment. Um, again, we want to make sure that. Like we're supporting that we're not blo a blocker for people to try and rally around their own solutions. Uh, and th again, the OAuth thing, right? Uh, uh, some of the other solutions, especially ones that we're trying to bridge across communication mediums, we had to kind of shut down because especially given what was going on in the community at the time, there was impersonation stuff going on and things like that. And so unless we could solve the identity piece, we were really concerned that that could be exploited in a very negative way. Um, but if we could solve those sorts of things, then we can let people duke it out and may the best chat win you know so yes damien uh, not to <clears throat> not to dig more into separate uh request workflow sure. discussion that has the session but uh, do you have any pcas on having or having a certain <laughs> uh that's a huh five like, years ago that the answer <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, um, I really try not to promise anything around dates. Um, uh, I will say you'll see some details in this in the, in the other session. So we actually, well, really Michael with, uh, uh, ran with the ball on this one quite a bit and prototyped a Bitbucket integration with a Drupal.org development site, a GitLab integration with a Drupal.org development site, a little bit with the GitHub stuff before it became clear that that just wouldn't work. Um, and so like some of the problems are solved, user syncing, repository syncing, like a lot of those things are actually already checked off the list. So it will have the uh, usual long tail problems like uh, GitLab has different rules for what a username is than Drupal.org. So we have to figure out what to do with the 30 people who don't have a valid username anymore. Uh, right. Including one for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, there's, um, there's some tricks to solve. Um, I would say, God, I would hope by Drupal Europe, I'm not just showing slides. <laughs> let's, let's put it that way. So um, I have a question about the, um, well, a concern actually was raised to me that I'd like to make sure it's brought forward. I like that there is a government page and a nonprofit page and the application is great. They're agency biased. So yep. there are, like, where are we highlighting that these are from universities? Agencies want to create their own stuff. Yep. The way that agencies are involved, but we really need to go up there because this could be something that's only agency focused. Yeah, I think so. And I had the, I've had the, some of the same conversations, possibly with some of the same people while I've been here, yeah. about in particular the higher education page. And again, I think that same model that we have where the front page now, the primary CTA is identify your persona and then we'll take you the right information for who you are. I think we can 
drill, we can iterate on that and drill down through that, recurse on that with some of the industry stuff and be like, okay, look, if you're here looking for someone to help you do this, this agency kind of content is what you need. If you're looking to understand the success or how to increase your success with what you're already doing, identify yourself there and find this content about how to participate in the, uh, the edgy slack uh, that exists and things like that. And again, um, I don't know those things or those communities. Um, so uh, I'm working with um, Max, I don't remember his last name, in the, in the higher ed community, and he's going to try and come back with a proposal for a landing page for that set of personas for higher ed. And we're gonna see how that goes, so, yes. Uh, I was thinking about the, uh, the site builder and sort of the discovery side of things. Um, it would be, uh, this is an observation, you know, that is completely untested, you know, sure. borderline uh, opinion. The, um, but it seems like we're, we're moving toward the, uh, like getting the composer require stuff on the project pages, which I think is good, but. The site builders at, uh, where I uh, work, we, they don't use any of the like prescribed ways of doing things from the uh, that are on that are promoted page. on those pages. Right. Yeah. They, they uh, like as developers, we use Composer to do things, which is not also on the page. As the site builders, they go through, they find the short name, and then they go into uh, into the dev server and they go to the update page and put the project in and does that, you know, using the FTP system right. to, to bring it into the project through the Drupal site itself. And, and like neither one of those workflows is advertised as the way to like move forward with these things. Yep. So uh, it seems like we're really uh, like stuck on supporting a, uh, a workflow of that, uh, you know, 10 years ago when I started was the way to do it, download tar Downloading tar walls, yep. It is, you know, you know, point your v-host at it and you're good to go. Yeah, that, but that doesn't seem to be really like the way anybody does anything at all anymore. I think that's true. And I think, I think the reason that we don't just suddenly, <laughs> that, that we don't take the next two weeks and go through and change to make a new box that says do this mm -hmm. is because that's actually still not defined yet. Like it's certainly not what's there, <laughs> right. but it's still not defined yet. And I think a lot of the conversations with uh, some of these initiatives are about let's get the exact one and then put it in place and it's, so it's this weird balance between well it's not relevant anymore when do we update it but, right that's why i'm saying it's yeah. not tested it's more in, uh, totally uh, yeah but it's one of those things that we really do need to find that and just do those you know do that you know we have like five different ways of of doing all these different things. Let's pick one or two that yep. fit those two personas. And there's some, there's some great uh, conversation currently going on in the official documentation initiative issue about how to identify what is those, mm -hmm. those one true ways uh, for doing things. So, yes. I do have a question for the, not for Neil. It's, it's like the ultimate, how do you scale Neil? Because um, I sit there with conversations and we talk about these great ideas and there's a limited amount of resources you need to own up to that issue. Um, I want to contact you, but I am aware that the Drupal Association is just trying to break even this year, which is totally effective. Yeah. But we have these big ideas, and I'm, I'm daydreaming about there should be a content editor role who curates this, and there's like a food co ops run into this issue. Yeah. They run into a certain department that just can't be staffed, and you get a content person, and their job is to curate, but also bring in revenue. Yeah. And I guess it brings up a staffing issue, a scale of like, is the Drupal Association looking at how they should scale their department, what direction? Because also, if you had that research and you approach the community and said, we need this role to, to, to accomplish this editorial initiative, That's people might buy in I mean, isn't that exactly what Megan announced the uh, $100,000 to promote people in the ship was for a coordinator position, somebody that would. But it's a temporary, I mean, it's a one time. So, but the notion, the notion being, right, so the idea of finding a sustainable model isn't going to come from, hey, guys, we need it to be sustainable, so will you put in $100,000 every year? It's got to be, <laughs> it's got to be bringing in someone who can, as part of the role, both identify the problems and identify how to create enough revenue to make the, it's a sustainable. I know it's tricky. Yeah, well, I, also agree, I, wasn't, I, was, I wasn't thinking about that. I was thinking about the Cordial office, and I keep referring ideas of him, and you have to look at the ideas of limited resources. And yeah. you know, I understand we don't have an immediate 
proposal and how to fix that. Absolutely, and I agree. I mean, as, as the person managing the team, I would love more resources here too. So, but, um, and I think, you know, it's being thought about. It's a matter of priority and it's a matter of not overstretching ourselves because in the last, we, we attempted to do deficit spend to, for a team scaling and that collapsed back down. Um, so we're trying to do it in a more <laughs> deliberate, more careful way uh, so that we're sure, you know, it's rough when you go through letting half your team go. So we want to make sure that if we do it again, we can we can keep everyone around. So. Uh, no, yeah, yeah, we have we have us we have a tell two in theory, although we don't have to go that long. Truthfully, I think. Well, that's why you, you, know, like you talked about earlier the uh, uh, run uh, both at the unit test yes, and scale pass. Scale pass. Uh, so that will reduce the cost there. We've done some uh, matching up of costs here and there. Like uh, there's a membership ask test, test, test results. Uh, uh, we've had sponsors for that in the past. Um, yeah. And did I hear you correctly though? You're willing to give us your credit card? <laughs> <laughs> because I will take that now. Sometimes I patch in, you know, even for TBM module, I'm on one of them. And there, I mean, that takes 25 minutes to go to the next one. That's true. You know, and I suppose there's a lot of issues in like the GitLab issue queue. About people like I run my own test monitor for my projects, right? And so I'm attuned to the talk, not the script channel. Mm -hmm. But like there's, there's certain rules, like if I can tell you I see an issue, turn the test bot off, right? But that kind of thing on those sort of broader picture things. I wonder if, yeah. you know, if we're piggybacking on other tools, we can kind of you know, make it more cost efficient without making people feel bad about running the So there's a few things like, for example, we're trying to change the way that testing configuration works so that people are not doing the full suite of regression tests against every patch. They're not, they're, it's not until it's RTBC, right? Do we need to do the, the rest of the environments, that kind of stuff. So there's definitely um, efficiencies to be found in terms of, well, you don't need to test that yet. You're going to test it later. Like, let's not do it three or four times before we actually get to the end of an issue. Yeah, we could probably communicate a little bit better on some of the other topics. I've, I've popped into issues before just wanting to know some patches or some that's kind of new to the community will submit a patch. And then I'll go through and just check every single environment box. And it's like, you don't even know if you patch 
Oh, you don't know if it applies. We're yes. pressing against everything out there, but we're not really telling you not. Yeah, there's, there's, there's nothing. Yeah, so the, the, there's a combination of policy, communication, and just ways we could enforce that a little bit better. Uh, yes? We're so good at preaching to the choir. <laughs> if you want to go out and raise money, we have to start asking the community of users, not yes. the community of, of associations and then and yes. shops that are in Drupal shops, right? Yep, absolutely. We don't do that. We ask for Drupal associations, fundraisers, for individuals, and for, for organizations. But well, why not just have a donate page? Why not well, we do place? have one, but yeah. Well, we do have a prominent place where people can go up and do that and have it better. Well, it's the disconnect because the customers don't come to you. The customers they really have an error. When they have an error and they want to type that error into a Google page and they see it, I'm sure a lot of those are people who are just novice users that land there. And if we can say, hey, you can go off and help make Google better, we need to have more help. And this is, this is where your money goes, blah, 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 blah. blah. I I think we could communicate that better. The other thing, though, is I think we need to do it on at at a, at a larger scale, yeah. right? Like so, the um, we do have some examples of this, right? We actually have some supporting partners who are end user organizations, Pfizer, J and J. There's a couple others, um, and those are people who understand that investing in Drupal is an investment and not an altruistic spend for their business, and that's a case that we think I think we need to figure out how to make better but it's very tricky because they're uh, with when we're talking those super large organizations it's these super long tail process of trying to high touch getting them to change their corporate policy around the notion of contributing as part of what they do yeah yeah I mean, I think that's necessary. We can't, we can't keep squeezing blood from a stone from the agencies. It's, yeah. Um, I had a conversation about that exact thing. How do you get the Jonathan and Jonathan to do Drupal and you know, like fund the DA and get involved? And I, I'm the you know, We need to, in the marketing materials change the tone of when you do the first ask for 200 fucking, sorry, $200 to support the VA, where when someone's new to Drupal, it's just communicated that we are a community, it helps to just be an initial member. When you start using Drupal, whatever project, you should be a member of the VA $200. It opens the door to start this process of mask. With Jonathan and Jonathan, it might happen for tight, years ago, it would happen for tiny little projects, and at least they would begin, it would open their wallet initially, they would have understood the concept from day one. And then it gradually grows. And I mean, we ask now, we're going out and saying, you know, here's a big thing you're using, and they've never. I'm going to imagine just say there's some gigantic projects where people do case studies and say, we just did blank and blank, boo, 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 boo. And you go to the organization page, and they're not a member of the DA. They're not getting the message. You yeah. have to have employees, but they're not getting this. Like, you contribute, it builds, it grows. Yeah, and, uh, I, like reading, I like reading an article where Cisco was like, we saved four hundred and fifty million dollars. What you know, Drupal. I'm like, do we have some? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. So one of the things I was thinking was, uh, and this it sounds kind of blatant, a lot like the you know, the giant yellow bar with the media saying we need to donate a dollar that day. Yep. But so on the test run, uh, if we find out what the average cost of per test is and put that into the check between 26 and 34 cents by the, uh, by the way but you pressing that button to submit all of those tests cost of you know just cost of the association you know five dollars yeah so you know i honestly i think people are more aware of that yeah those things cost money somebody's paying for what I'm hearing, and it's pie in the sky stuff that we'd have to find some implementation for time for. Hey, Brendan, how do you feel about some more projects? Um, <laughs> but but would be things like, yeah, let's start, let's do that, like ching, 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 every time you hit the test spot button, um, and and increase the, the 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 scroll. I think that would be cool. I actually think it would re be really interesting if you're not an authenticated user, or if you're an authenticated user who's not a member, to put a ask on download pages or something like that. You know, like. Hey, we see you're not a member. Could you contribute to the project? Yeah, we, we want to moderate our asks and ask at the right time, not let it out of Jimmy Wales's face everywhere. Yeah, we have experimented with that a little bit. Absolutely true. We're waiting for perfect. We don't have to. We have to experiment. 
That's yeah, that's what we do. Yeah. But yes, absolutely sure. Maybe also do check for that. Like, when we did the new gender field, people were mad at us for doing the good instead of waiting for the perfect. Like, we got hurt by that a little bit. So, we have to be careful. Because you need to do your own sex sometimes. Right. I mean, that's true. But, yeah. But we're just saying, like, it's easy to say perfect is the enemy of good, except you can easily start a forest fire. By trying to do something good and it not being perfect in some way, that is perfect by somebody's not. So I hear you. <laughs> it's also really easy to completely miss that when you're going and you're trying to do something that's safe. Like, okay, we're you know we're gonna do this. I know we're gonna offend somebody, so let's just go ahead and do it. You offend the wrong thing, and things can really fall. Apart. It could absolutely, yeah. So, I mean, it, you, you, even the small steps. Have, even the small steps need to be deliberative action, but they don't have to be the big monolithic solution, which I think is a totally fair point. Um, really quick point. Not only is this an all-male panel, this is an all-male community which is also just something to go to in terms yep. of where do we find diversity and how we build this in the yep. here. I'm happy with, yeah, Danya, Danya can't, couldn't be here at the con, but I'm, but yes. Yeah. No, no, I totally. And, and we had, um, before, uh, before our team size collapsed, the diversity on the team was definitely better. And it's really, uh, I think about that fairly frequently, actually. And it's, it's strange, I, believe it or not, I was actually the last hire on the engineering team. So in my role leading the team since then, I've never had the opportunity to hire. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, been, it's been a little bit interesting. But. Thing, sure. Not speak to you. Uh, you know, those of us who are sitting in your office that care about the pool and for a DevOps team or something like what specifically what is helpful to you from people who are interested in this, right? Because my my ability or interest in writing like triple seven patch to the cloud work is probably pretty low, but I think I think that's lower on the total pool of things you need, right? What do you need from us? That's a good question. I kinda wanna throw it to the to the list here. Um, uh, <laughs> we already promised your credit card. Yeah, bags and bags of money. So, uh, you know, Drupal.org, it's, it's a Drupal site, huge Drupal sites actually. Uh, so, uh, we have dev sites that can be uh, spun up to uh, work on issues. You know, we have pile of custom code that uh, can get, needs to be more custom for some things or cleaned up things in other areas. Um, and uh, so yeah, Drupal development uh, is a thing that uh, we can do uh, or people can help with. Um, for larger initiatives, we want to make sure that um, the planning is done um, with us. Uh, in the past, or all the time, we have to, uh, occasionally have people build this whole grand thing and uh, hand it to us like, here you go, Dude, I hope you want this, because it's yours now. <laughs> yep. uh, and you know, then we have to uh, you know, take tech, tech uh, if we do decide to take it, we have to tech control that forever. Um, and, and if we don't decide to take it, they're very I, upset. I, you know, Ryan mentioned earlier, um, Documenting Drupal CI the YAML file. Sure. We want to ask them, you know, is it is it a coding task, but is it a technical task? And that you know, it requires technical understanding. Yeah. Um, testing in QA, especially around the GitLab uh, push out. When that comes up, yeah. Gonna, you know, hopefully. Especially for someone who has a, I believe you self described yeah. fanboy. No, uh, it's we are we're getting the enterprise version of it, uh, and there's some custom code that is not public yet, but will be at some point, which you in theory could download and run on your own instance. Uh, but I don't think that I don't think the the testing is there. The testing is you know how do things work now, and how do they you know when we spin up this staging environment. Uh, my thought is we'll be open for a few weeks and give everybody access to just straight up. Literally, 
yeah. just functional testing. Help us. Everybody core commit, you know, access commits core on the <laughs> staging environment just because that'll get people to play with it. Yeah. <laughs> just help, have, help us find edge cases. And uh, keep an eye on the marketing initiative. That's, that's, yeah. Yeah. Which isn't really a infrastructure technical thing, but it is something that requires extra eyes on it. I mean, I think 50% of the feedback from this room, <coughs> excuse me, which is the engineering geek types for the most part, like 50% of the feedback was still about content and, and presentation and editorial. Like, and I've had to step into participating in that myself, and I think we can do that to a certain degree, or we can find who we know are experts and point them to us, because that would help as well. Yeah. And the documentation guy would be the maintainer of it. So yeah, it certainly doesn't hurt. But I think when you have to do the documentation and all this stuff, like any of the graphs, you're changing the graphic framework, and it's because you're probably fine with my information. I mean, I admit at the beginning of the day, but I feel like that needs to be an example of mine. Which it is. No, it is. Yeah, I mean, that's because I, I work pretty close with Malcolm and he's a downstream on people's CI. So, but I think I think the the larger issue with what we want to help on the people at work is that like ninety five percent of the work is not coding. You know, it's not development. It's like defining the use cases, coming up with the the plan, you know, architecting, orchestrating, doing all of that. But then oftentimes we want to come along and you know, just write some code. You know, well, that's helpful, but we can do that. You know, it's, it's more the um, just figuring out what it is that we need to do. That's yeah, the getting our arms around just the problems is often yeah. more difficult. Yeah. Question about the Drupal CI again. Is that will that allow us to actually turn off certain aspects of the test spot and just yeah. say like I don't care at all about any of these? Yes, exactly. Just run this. Exactly. But and that can be done now. Yeah. Yep. Today here. <laughs> <laughs> If you know, if you know how to use it. <laughs> yep, and there is a docs page up. There, yeah, there is a docs page. The, the only thing that's not quite documented is the uh, custom commands. And really, the only thing that's missing from the custom command calculus is the bash environment variable you can include in that custom command in the first pass. Okay. That's, that's Something you could do is spread that word tomorrow <laughs> that you can turn things off. You know, like, <laughs> there's going to be a lot of tests going tomorrow, right? We're looking at This is a relatively new thing in the past two weeks. Yeah. Well, there's there's actually a patch in for the community health period that does the splitting things up. So um, I showed it to Jess and she was like, went back in, she said, this is very important in market major. So if anybody else wants to look at it. Yeah, yeah. that would be yeah. happening. Yeah, we'll, we'll be around uh, for the sprints tomorrow. Uh, and yeah, I can dig into any uh, specific, uh, uh, yeah, working on Drupal.org. Yeah, and you're interested. Yeah, and then um, the other way is like there's a lot of these initiatives where we are uh, bridging over to a core where you know we have a lot of issues like you know when we do something new with updates, we're going to be changing the API for how updates work. There's going to be a lot of patches for core for we're going to need review. We're going to need people's eyes on them. That's also going to help. So, or you know if you're in one of those groups that's particularly focused, like if you participate regularly in DD&I and, and that kind of a thing, helping that group to API-ify the, the Open Demographics Initiative would be really helpful. Writing a module that consumes it would be really helpful. Like, um, those are things that we're going to try and work on together. But, and that's nicely scoped <laughs> compared to these things that touch a lot of other stuff. Um, I think that was a great final question, unless anyone has anything else burning. So I think I'll wrap it up here. Thank you very much for your time, everybody. Um, I encourage you to check out the recordings of any of these types of sessions if you haven't seen them already. They're relevant to a lot of the things we talked about here. Um, so uh, if you see something there that you didn't have a chance to look at, please look up the recording. Um, and of course, join us for sprints tomorrow. Um, and leave your feedback on all of the sessions you attend. All right, thank you. Yes. Thanks, everyone. Nice, nice job. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.